you got your Bibles, open up to Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, I was sharing, Pastor, when he called me the other day, said, hey, Pat, can you teach? And I said, yeah, and I usually have a few studies in the back of my mind. But then he said this, he said, Pat, teach something you're comfortable with. And I immediately went to something that I teach almost every day in counseling. It's Ephesians chapter 5. I call this the six keys of doing marriage God's way. Now, whether you're married to a spouse or whether you're married to the Lord, uh, these principles will apply. They apply to our lives and for our lives. And if you're not married to a spouse and you're not married to the Lord, well, at the end of the service, we'll do a little wedding ceremony for you and you can get married off. Amen? <laughs> so in Ephesians chapter 5, if you open up there, we're going to look at the six keys I, in a sense that I call. And again, keys are things that we use to unlock. Keys are things that we use to open. Keys are things that we use to start. I have these keys in my pocket, and, and yet if I take this key, it's one thing just to say, hey, I got the keys, but it's another thing if I take this key and I put it in the lock and I open the door and I enter in. In the same way with the principles of God and the promises of God, uh, they are keys. And oftentimes we have the keys uh, of the Lord, and yet they, they, we have them in our hands. We have the keys, but we never put them in. We never put them in the ignition. We never start them. We never open the door and enter into all the things that God has for us. Well, this morning, as we look at, in a sense, six keys of doing marriage God's way, again, whether you're married to a spouse or married to the Lord, every one of these things apply. And again, when we go God's way, we get God's results. When we go our way, we get our results. Unfortunately, daily, I have people who sit on my couch, and they've been doing things their way, and they've been getting their results, and it's usually miserable, not a good thing. They're not uh, happy and enjoying the way things are going, and yet let's look at what God would say. Let's look at his keys, and then let's line up and say, am I doing things God's way, or am I doing things my way? And yet again, if we're doing things God's way, we're going to get his results. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to be beginning with verse 15. It says this, it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, uh, do not be un unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. The first key that I always like to uh, talk about and to, to express is that, hey, we are living in a time when these days are evil. There is an enemy that is out there. The enemy wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your relationship with Jesus Christ. He wants to destroy the relationships around you, whether it's your spouse or your kids or, or your place of work. He is all about dividing and conquering, dividing and conquering. And as we're going to see today, sin always divides. Love brings together, but the enemy is all about this, and we need to understand that the enemy is out there. He wants to destroy me. He wants to destroy my relationship with Jesus. He wants to destroy my marriage, and if I am not walking circumspectly, then he will have his way. He's very good at what he does, but I love that because it says, see then that you walk circumspectly. A while back, Pastor Rob was teaching on this subject, and he was talking about what that looks like walking circumspectly. And that's not me and my wife, you know, walking down the beach with not a care in the world, just enjoying, you know, God's creation and what God's doing. And we're not looking where we're walking. We're not caring. Why? Because we're just in love and we're just walking along. This is not what he's talking about. He's saying, hey, you are in a battle. And may I say, all you have to do is look out and look at the divorce rate and look at where the families are going. The enemy is having a heyday with our kids, with our spouses, with, with our work. He's just on the rampage. And we need to be careful where we're walking. This is like the enemy. We're, we're in a battle, and, and we're walking along, and we're in a minefield. And we need to be very, very careful where we put our foot, because if we put our foot in the wrong place, boom, boom. Maybe this morning, on your way to church, you woke up and things, you thought things were great and, you know, and all of a sudden you go out and you interact with your wife, your kids or the car or something like that and boom, you know, the enemy planted these little landmines and you happen to step on one and next thing you know, you don't want to get close to God. You don't want to go to church. Well, fine, if that's the way it's going to be, you just stay home or whatever, but you're not home because you're here. <laughs> but anyways, but the enemy and he's really good at, at doing this and he sets those things out there. 
I know for me, a few months back, as we're reading through the Word of God, and we do that every year, and I was sitting there reading, and in 2 uh, Second Samuel chapter 11, it's the, it eventually gets to the story of David and Bathsheba, but as I was reading that, it was like saying, it's a time when kings should be out to battle, and David wasn't where he should have been. He should have been out to battle. If he was out to battle, he wouldn't have been on the rooftop, he wouldn't have seen Bathsheba and all of those other things, but... As I was reading that, God just started speaking in my heart, man, Pat, you know, you, your life, it is a battle. And you need to be prepared each and every day because the enemy is out there and he wants to set these little minefields and, 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 and you know, he wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your marriage. And I'm going, yes, Lord, yes, I need to have on the whole armor of God today. And it, and it was incredible. I love the picture of what happened. I put my Bible down. I get done. I'm, yes, Lord, this is what I need for today. And I get up, and I'm walking, and I walk through the bedroom back to my closet. And as I'm walking through, my wife made a comment to me. She said something to me. Now, she didn't say what I thought she said, but because I heard what I thought she said, I stopped. I look at her, I go, what? And she looks at me, and then I made a comment. And she looks at me and goes, what? And then, and then she makes a comment back to me. And I stop and I go, what? And I make a comment back to her and boom, boom. And next thing you know, this person that I love and I care about and that, man, I don't ever want to, you know, I'm thinking these thoughts that I'm like, man, that's from the pit of hell, you know? And no, I love this person. Yet the enemy is so good at doing that and how quickly he can do that within each and every one of our lives. The first key is we need to understand there's an enemy out there. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your relationship with Jesus Christ. He wants to destroy your marriage, your kids, all of these things. We need to be very, very careful of where we are walking. First key. Second key, continuing on. Therefore, do not be under unwise, verse 17, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I love this. The first key is there is an enemy out there. He wants to destroy your marriage, destroy your life, destroy your relationship. Second key is he says, do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And I love the picture that Paul is painting here. A lot of people will use this verse to talk about how you shouldn't drink. Again, there's a lot of other verses you could use to talk about this, but that's really not what Paul is saying here. He is saying, in a sense, do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, or be intoxicated or under the influence. In a sense, if I am going to be under the influence, I take this substance, I put it in, this substance takes control of me, of my actions, my attitudes, the things that I say. If I'm, if I'm drunk, I'm going to say things and do things I normally wouldn't say and do. Well, Paul would say in the same way where you would take this substance and put it in, he says we are to take the Holy Spirit and put the Holy Spirit within us, that we would act and respond in a way I normally don't act and respond. Why? Because I'm a sinner. I don't know about you, but uh, I think you're a sinner too, because that's what the Scripture says. All have sinned. We've all shall fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinners, and yet if we're sinners, we need a Savior. That's why Jesus came, hung on the cross to die for us, and yet Jesus says, man, if you open your heart, I will fill you. I will give you my Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will enter in, and the Holy Spirit will cause us to act and respond in a way I normally don't act. I won't act like sinful, selfish Pat anymore. I will act like St. Pat. I will act <laughs> St. Patrick. I will act in a way that I normally don't act and respond. Why? Because I'm no longer under the influence of this, but I'm now under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now the actions that I'm going to demonstrate are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And yet what I love about that is there in Galatians chapter 5, it tells us when it talks about the things of the flesh, the things of the Spirit, it says these things are evident. Evident. What does that mean? It means they are things that you see. You see. You see in one another. You, you see in other people. They are things that are evident. The work of the flesh, outbursts of wrath, anger, selfish ambition, jealousy, yuck, 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 this whole list of things that are evident, the things of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. How do I know whether I'm responding in the flesh or if I'm responding in the Spirit? Well, it's by what other people are seeing within my life. You know, when the kids were little, let's say I, you know, come home from work and I walk in the door and my wife looks over and she looks at me and she sees this look. She turns around to the kids. Kids, we're walking around on eggshells tonight. Why? 
What did she see? Did she see the fruit of the spirit or the fruit of the flesh? Tell me. The fruit of the flesh. The flesh separates. The spirit brings closer together. When she sees the things of the flesh, it doesn't make her want to get closer to me. It makes her want to get farther away. But if I walk in the door and my wife looks over at me and she sees a sparkle in my eye and I'm looking at her and she goes, kids, we're having a great night tonight. Why? Because it's evident of what is being seen. And what did she see there? Did she see the flesh or the spirit? She saw the spirit. The spirit will always bring us closer together. And that is what is needed. That's what's needed to be seen within your heart, within my life within each one of us. I'm guaranteeing you, the person next to you, they do not want to see the things of the flesh. They want to see the things of the Spirit. Now, what we need to do if we are, you know, um, if we've given our life to Jesus Christ and we're honoring Him, if it's the flesh, it must be, needs to be repented of, acknowledged as such. It's not, it's the flesh, it's sin, it's wrong, I need to repent, I need to ask forgiveness. We don't just pass it off, we don't say, well, that's just how I am, or I had a bad day, whatever. No, if what is evident within our hearts and lives is the things of the flesh, it's the things of the flesh. And if the things of the Spirit are not evident, then we are walking in the flesh and pleasing our own desires. We are not walking in the Spirit because what needs to be seen is those things. So, first key is there's an enemy out there who wants to destroy your life. We need to be careful where we're walking. Second key is, man, do not be so filled with the things of this world that what is seen in your heart and life is the things of the flesh. But we need to be filled with the things of the Holy Spirit. And yet what I love about that analogy when it says, um, do not be intoxicated or under the influence of that, if I was to go out and to drink wine and to be intoxicated, uh, uh, the next day it wears off and, and I'm no longer drunk. I'm no longer intoxicated. I'm no longer, as the police officer would say, Mr. Shore, you're under the influence. I'm no longer under the influence. I would have to drink more the next day and more the next day to stay drunk. In the same way, Paul here in Ephesians is saying for each and every one of us, if we are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, this isn't a one-time deal. This is each and every day asking his Holy Spirit to fill us, to control our lives. Why? My wife does not want to see my flesh. My coworkers do not want to see my flesh. Uh, and, and all too often, you know, that does happen. And yet what they need to see is the Holy Spirit moving and working in my heart, my life, my kids, the people that I'm around. They need to see the Spirit. They need to see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, all of that fruit of the Spirit. And yet I go through this ritual every single morning. I get up, I go in, I take a shower, and as the water is running down, I ask the Lord, I said, Lord, please fill me with each and everything that I need today. I need to be filled with you. I need to be filled with your spirit. Why? Because I want people to see your spirit within me. I want people to see the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, the self-control. And they will not see it if I am filled with the things of this world. They will not see it if I am intoxicated under the influence of the things of this world. But they will see it if I am intoxicated by, if I am under the influence of the power of the Holy Spirit. First key is, people, there is an enemy out there. He wants to destroy your life. We need to be careful where we're walking. Second key is, do not be filled with the things of this world, but be filled with the things of the Spirit, asking Him each and every day to fill you. Third key, look at verse 21. Before it gets to verse 22, I love this. In 21, it says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. We're to submit to one another. This is that mutual submission that, that was so often missed. You know, and especially in the, you know, the, the guys, no, no, let's just go to 22. Let's go to 22. Wives submit. No, no, no. Before we go to 22, we got to go to 21. And in 21, it says we are to submit one to another in the fear of the Lord. And what I love about this is as the example of Jesus, this is all about others. This is all about others. This is not about me. And, and again, so oftentimes, you know, I love the picture of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I love this picture. And yet with God the Father, there is an order that is there. But in that order of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy, you ever hear God the Father saying, hey, I'm in charge, listen to me. Or Jesus saying, I'm in charge, listen to me. Or the Holy Spirit saying, I'm in charge, listen to me. No, what do you have? You have God so loved the world 
that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You have Jesus saying, man, I'm going to go away and I'm going to send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. He is going to be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. You have the Spirit pointing to Jesus. They're all doing this. They're all lifting up the other person. And that's what it is. It's all, it's all about others. Jesus Christ did not come to be served. And guys, think about that this afternoon when you're sitting there on the couch with a remote control. Uh, if you're going to play Jesus, he didn't come to be served. Hey, where's my chips? You know, whatever the case may be. Not that any of you guys would ever do that. But he came to serve, to give his life a ransom for many, many. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, which is a whole study in and of itself. But that's what he did. That's what he came. And it was all about others. He laid down his life for you and for me. It's all about others. And when we're going through the keys, again, hear this key. There's a mutual submission. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about others. And marriage never works, whether it's your relationship with Jesus Christ or your relationship with your spouse, when it's all about you, uh, it doesn't work. But when it's all about others, when it's about the other people involved, then it will always work. It will always work. God honors that. First key is, is that um, there's an enemy out there. We need to be very, very careful where we're walking. Second key is don't be filled with the things of this world, but be filled with the things of God. Third key is there is a mutual submission. It's all about the other person lifting them up and extolling them. And so much more, as the scripture would say, as you see the day approaching. Fourth key is verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of the body. Therefore, just as Christ is subject to, uh, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wise be to their own husbands in everything. Pick it up at the end of verse 33 as well. It says, let the wife see that she respect her husband. This is kind of where we get the whole love and respect thing. But it says, wives submit. Now again, oftentimes I talk to people, and you know, especially for ladies, when you say wives submit, man, the, the hair on the back of their neck goes up. It, it's because they don't understand the true biblical definition of submission. And I, I think oftentimes with guys as well, we don't understand the true biblical definition of submission. I want to show you, I'm going to give you a picture of the true definition of biblical submission. Ian, I'm going to bar you for a minute. Come up here. Come on. Put the Bible down. Same right here. He's connected to the matrix here. Anyways, Ian, he's the man. He's the big, big man, strong man. Yeah, he's the man. I get to play the woman, okay? Now, listen, watch. Guys, watch too, okay? Because I had more guys come up to me afterwards and said, man, Pat, that was a great picture. Watch. This is the biblical definition of submission. <laughs> this is right where I want to be. Why? Because if this is Jesus, man, I want to be as close as I can. I, I want to hear his heartbeat. I want to be right here. It's a place of safety. It's a place of comfort. It's a place that I find rest. The biblical definition of submission. Good job, Ian. Anyways, give my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so when he says, hey, ladies, submit, in a sense, this is the place that you want to be, but it also says that you are to respect your husbands. And again, respect is a man's greatest need. And ladies, uh, again, I oftentimes I'll preach this in marriage class over and over again. Man, for you to say a few kind words, oftentimes when I'm doing counseling, I say this. I say, ladies, listen, listen to me. I said, a man who has a woman by his side that's encouraging him and building him up, that man believes he can do almost anything. But a man who has a woman by his side that is tearing him down and yuck, 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 that man wants to almost do nothing. And yet you were called, may I say, even commanded by God to come along this man's side and to be his cheerleader, to cheer him on, to root him on, to be there for him. And I love that picture and that analogy as well, because, uh, you know, when my daughter was in ninth grade, she, uh, as a freshman, she got into the varsity cheer squad, which was kind of, you know, not something normal, but my wife did. So for four years, we went to every single football game. Um, we didn't go to watch football. We went to watch the cheerleaders. But in four years, we were, we were like a really artsy a school, so our band was phenomenal, but we were terrible in sports. In fact, we still hold the record in the state of Washington for the 82 to nothing we got beat. And, in, and I was there. I was at that game. 
Most of the games, we got slaughtered, we got killed. We won maybe two or three games in four years. We were bad. <laughs> but listen, this is what I noticed with my daughter. Every single game, knowing they were going to get killed or what, my daughter was there cheering her heart out, regardless of the score. Ladies, God comes to you, and He says, you know what? You were to come along this man's side. You were to be there. You were to cheer him on regardless of the score. doesn't matter what the score is. This is what God has called you to. And oftentimes, if I'm doing premarital counseling at this point, I'll look at the girl and say, now listen, this is what God commands. This is what He's asking you. If you're unwilling to do that, then do not get married. Those single who are thinking about getting married, if you're unwilling to do that, do not get married. Because then you're going to do marriage your way. And you're not going to do it God's way. But if we're going to do it God's way, it is regardless of the score. We are to be there. We are to encourage. We are to build up. We are to lift up. That's what God calls you. First key is there's an enemy out there. He wants to destroy your life. Be careful where you're walking. Second key is don't be so filled with the things of the world that the flesh is seen, but be filled with the Spirit of God that the Spirit of God would be seen within your life. Third key is there is a mutual submission. It's all about others. Fourth key for ladies, it's that submission. It's that respect, building up your husband, encouraging him. Fifth key is we're moving on. Verse 25, husband, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. For he who loves himself, he who loves his wife, loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. Third thing, or, or excuse me, fifth, fifth key that we have is husbands love your wives. And then for us husbands, because we do need, you know, we're visual. Give me a picture of what that looks like. You know, oftentimes I have guys on my couch and I said, you love your wife? Of course I love my wife. And then I walk them through the biblical definition of what love is supposed to look like. And then I say, do you really love your wife? At least according to what the scripture says, are you doing it God's way? And yet here he gives us a picture just as what is this like? What does this love look like to your wife? Just as Christ gave himself for the church. What did Jesus Christ do for you and me, the church? He laid down his life. Huh? He died for us. Pat, are you telling me I need to die for my wife? No, but God is. That's what he's saying. Yeah, that's what you're called to do. That's what you're commanded to do. And I remember at Bible college, I had a professor one time and he was talking about, you know, you, you want to get a woman? Here, two things. First thing is, you lay down your life just like Jesus laid down his life. The second thing is, just like Jesus, you take a basin of water and you take a towel. Remember the Last Supper? Jesus went and he did, did something. What did he do? He washed their feet. Husbands say that. Wash their feet. And I remember my Bobby Collar professor saying, hey, what woman wouldn't want to be right there next to a guy? That in the example of Jesus is laying down his life, giving his life for her, and washing her feet washing your feet and I love that because it says husbands love husbands love and he walks us through what that is supposed to look like husbands love your wives that word love in the Greek it's agape it is unconditional love which means it's not based upon the other person for God so agape, so loved the world. He loved you and me while we were still dead in trespasses and sin. God didn't say, well, Pat, if you treat me right, then I'll, then I'll love you. No, he goes beyond that. He says, Pat, I don't care how you're going to treat me. I don't care how you are. I am going to demonstrate my love for you. That though you're a sinner, though you're in sin, I am going to demonstrate love and extend my love for you. Now it's up to you whether you will receive it or reject it. But it, but it says, husbands, love your wives unconditionally, which means it's not based upon her, her attitude, her actions. This is a command from our Heavenly Father that, that, that you are called to do. You are called to love her. You were called to love her, to give your life, to get down and to wash your feet, regardless of her, her response, her actions, her attitudes, regardless. It, that has nothing to play with it. It's you obeying the command of God. And at this point in my premarital counseling, I oftentimes look at the guy and I say, now listen, as a man, you want to marry this woman. If you are unwilling 
to love her in this way, unwilling to, regardless of her, lay down your life and wash her feet, do not get married. But if this is what you want to do, if this is your heart, then by all means, you go and you get married. First key is there's an enemy out there. He wants to destroy your life. Be careful where you're walking. Second key is do not be so filled with the things of this world, but be filled with the things of God, with His Holy Spirit, that you would operate and act in a way that is love, joy, peace, patience. It's demonstrated. Others see it. Third key is uh, there's a mutual submission. It's all about honoring the other person. Fourth key for ladies is submission. It's respecting. It's building him up. Fifth key for men. It's us laying down our lives. It's us washing our wife's feet. And oftentimes in, in counseling, I'll say, you know what? And, and, and I believe maybe for you, and for some of you maybe here today, maybe you need to go home and you need to get on your hands and knees and you need to wash your wife's feet. It will radically impact her. It will touch her in a way that, you know, with no strings attached, it's just, no, I'm going to do this. And again, you know, for guys, when it comes to marriage, guys are all about touching in the physical. Women are all about touching in emotional. But man, when we touch each other in the spiritual, we create a deeper bond that goes well beyond anything we experience, experience here. And yet last key, and this is the most important thing. Verse 30, it says, For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, the two should become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. And I love that. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. Wait, 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 wait. Here, here, Paul, you're talking about intimacy between a man and a woman. And again, you know, oftentimes there's the difference there. Men spell intimacy, S-E-X. Women spell intimacy, O-N-E. It's that oneness. But he says, man, you're talking about that. And yet then you stop and you say, yeah, but I speak concerning Christ in the church which means our relationship with our spouse should look like our relationship with Jesus Christ. And yet, why so often doesn't it? It doesn't because we're not doing it God's way. We're not taking the key. We're not opening the door and entering into his promises. We're not turning on the ignition and going anywhere with what God has provided for us. But I love this. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. The two should become one flesh. This is what the Lord is all about. He's all about oneness, being one with you, having oneness in the marriage. God said it in Genesis. Moses said it. Jesus said it. And here Paul said the very, very same thing. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. And yet, if this is supposed to represent my relationship with Jesus Christ, what we're supposed to see here, how did that happen in my relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, I was just lost in my sin. I was just doing my own selfish, self-centered thing that I did. And some guy walks up on the street and he says, Pat, do you want to experience the grace and the mercy of God? Do you want to know that all of your sin, all of the yuck from the past can be washed and cleansed and forgiven? And I got a yucky past. And I said, yeah, that's what I want. And he says, okay, I'm going to pray with you. Pray this prayer and meet it from your heart. And so I prayed this prayer with the guy standing there on the street, and I meant it from my heart. And yet something incredible happened. Something incredible happened at that moment. All of a sudden, God answered that prayer. All of a sudden, I'm standing there, and although I have all this sin and yuck from the past, God touches me, God heals me, God forgives me, He cleanses me, He washes me, He forgave me just because I said this prayer, but I meant it from my heart. And yet what happened after that? The Bible calls it's a Greek word called koinonia. It, it means fellowship. I all of a sudden, you know, became one with God. I have a relationship with God. I can talk to God and he's talking to me. You know, growing up, God was in a box. I went to church. He's in a box. There he is. He's in a box. You do all of these things and there God is in the box. But God doesn't live in a box. He wants to live inside of you and me. He wants to make himself known through you and through me. And yet when we confess our sin, sin separates, but love brings together. When we confess our sin, he is just and faithful to forgive us, cleanse us of all unrighteousness, and we become one with God. We become one with him, and we have this incredible fellowship with him, with our Father in heaven. But in the same way that I have that and experience that with God, and if I sin, I confess my sin, and He's just and faithful to forgive me, to cleanse me, to wash me. In the same way, when it comes to others, maybe when it comes to your spouse or other people, how does that oneness happen? Well, in a marriage relationship, it happens in the same way. 
by going to the cross. Oftentimes, I'll have people sitting on my couch and there's been infidelity and things like this. And, and whoever was wounded or hurt, they want the other person to experience you know, the pain and the hurt and the suffering that they're going through. Maybe you're sitting here today and you want, you know, somebody else has done something to you and you want to, them to experience the hurt, the pain, the suffering. May I say, the other person cannot. They, they, they're not built that way. God didn't intend that to happen. There is one man and one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. He and he alone suffered on the cross. He and he alone can receive that guilt and that hurt and that pain and that shame. That other person, oftentimes when I have a husband and wife, man, that other person, they can't. They'll never know your hurt. They'll never know your pain. And yet you carry it in this bitterness and you hold on to it and, you, and, you're just, and it makes you miserable inside because you're holding on to something that God never intended you to hold on to. He provided a place for us to take our hurt and our pain and the bitterness. He provided a place, and that place is the cross of Jesus Christ. And when we take that to the cross, there we can be set free. There we can get rid of all the yuck of the past and the guilt and the shame and the hurt. We can get rid of all that. We can lay it there at his feet, and we can walk away. We can be just like that day when I accepted the Lord. I was cleansed, and I was forgiven, and my burden was, was gone. And yet how many of us are toting around burdens that God said, hey, I sent my son to die on the cross. And you're carrying something that I never intended you to carry. Would you please bring it? And yet within our marriages so oftentimes, these things go on. I hate the fact when I do things that cause grief and pain to my wife. I never enjoy it. I hate the fact when I do things that cause grief and pain to my pastor. And I do that often. And I don't enjoy that either. I hate the fact when I do things that cause grief and pain to my kids. But I love the fact that God has provided a place. And when I've done things to hurt my wife and I go to the cross, I love the fact of what happens next. Because what happens next? We go to the cross, we ask for forgiveness, and then we kiss and make up. Where sin has separated, we kiss and make up. We become one. And maybe you, within your marriage, Maybe it's your marriage to Jesus Christ. You need to kiss and make up today. God has provided a way. He is waiting for you. Maybe it's within your physical marriage. And oftentimes I'll say, you need to go take a walk on the beach or get away and ask, seek that forgiveness. Get it out, put it out there and allow the blood of Jesus Christ to wash you, to cleanse you, to forgive you. Amen? Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, the things written here within your word, God. We thank you that you are a merciful and a gracious God. And Lord, I do ask and pray. Lord, there may be some sitting here today in their relationship with you. They have allowed for sin. They've allowed for bitterness. They've allowed for hurt and pain. And they're looking at some other human being to, to maybe uh, uh, atone for that or cover that or wash and cleanse that. And yet, God, some other human being cannot. There is only one that can, and that one is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross, who died on the cross, to extend forgiveness and grace and mercy. And if that's you today, again, simply by coming to the Lord, confessing the sin. Sin is separated, but yet when you confess your sin, He washes and cleanses and forgives you of all unrighteousness. And if you want to be washed, if you want to be cleansed, if you want to be forgiven, if you want all the garbage to go away, just like I did years ago, you can do the same this morning. You can come and you can pray a prayer just like this. You can say, Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to wash me. I ask you to cleanse me. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit that I would be washed and cleansed. Watch over me. Guide me. In Jesus' name, amen. And yet maybe this morning you're in a marriage and there's a lot of hurt and pain in this marriage. As you hear God's way, you've been going your way. Your way has brought about a lot of hurt and pain. There's your way and there's God's way. Continue going your way, you'll continue getting your results. But if you will go God's way, you will get his results. I encourage you, plead with you, get together with your spouse, get some time alone, 
Acknowledge your sin, ask for forgiveness, and ask the blood of Jesus Christ to wash you and cleanse you. He can heal. He can forgive. He can restore. That other person can't, but God can. God can do that.